How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 62nd video on the channel, and today we're going to be looking at another of the seminars Felix Autry held between 1980 and 1988, The Four Unconsciouses. As the name suggests, this lecture deals with the role of the unconscious in schizoanalysis, introducing many ideas that would be echoed in later works, like his infamous schizoanalytic cartographies. For this episode, I'm using the translation by the fantastic Taylor Atkins over at Fractal Ontologies. Although I unfortunately can't use page numbers for each quote, I'll link their source in the description below. Without further ado, let's get into it. Gautry begins by outlining four dimensions found in assemblages as they apply to the unconscious, the subjective, material, territorial, and machinic. The first of these is organized around what he calls components of expression, a rather nebulous term that contains all sorts of things from words and clothing, to symptoms and communication on the molecular level. When it comes to what is attached to, I think Watry puts it best. This type of unconscious is that of the personal subject of the individuation of the assemblage of enunciation, or potentially of a collective assemblage subject of enunciation. Essentially, as I said in my series on the three ecologies, a subject is a little like a ridge formed from the collision of tectonic plates. Individuals are constantly being extracted from these arrangements of components of expression, with pronouns being the most obvious example on the linguistic front. From a whole arrangement of voices, you select a specific identity when you use the pronoun I. However, this self isn't an island built on language alone. Instead, all sorts of other components come into play, like the aforementioned clothing, symptoms, and so on and so on. Going even further, the resulting ridges often don't line up neatly with specific people. A wide range of heterogeneous things are implicated under subjectivity. Regardless though, Gautry's focus here is more on individual patients. Each dimension, he says, has its black holes, something shown in this diagram. These are essentially traps, which, in the subjective unconscious, manifest themselves as things like obsessional neurosis and hysteria. In the first case, which is similar to OCD, something that leads to the subject losing consistency can cause what Guattari calls a re-territorialization of components of expression. In other words, certain ways of expressing things become fixated, which shows up in the repetitive actions that characterize the disorder. Territorialization isn't necessarily a bad thing though. It's simply a process that slows components down, without which there would be no consistency or subject to even speak of. In the first dimension of the unconscious, we find a system of territorialized signs the metastable components that make up our subjectivity. This can be both negative and positive. On the one hand, the system can collapse in on itself due to something of a linguistic black hole, the result being hysteria, characterized by psychosomatic symptoms. On the other hand, there's the blossoming of the heterogeneous components discussed earlier. In Gautry's own words, This first dimension of expression of the assemblage in the unconscious field can, therefore, pass into a register of the black hole, but it can also pass into a diagrammatic register. This diagrammatic register is also called that of components of passage. As the Latin name suggests, entering the register can lead to creative transformations that modify how expression surfaces. Quattro refers to the subjective unconscious as both neurotic and autistic for this reason. Since falling into obsessional hysterical black holes is just as possible as generating novel forms of expression. He additionally refuses to play a zero-sum game. Both neurotic and diagrammatic processes can intermingle in the same subjective unconscious. The one doesn't exclude the other. It's with this that we arrive at the second dimension, the material. The defining characteristic of this level is the fact that it's organized around components of content, rather than those of expression, which it functions independently from. Pathologically, these components surface as hallucinations and delusions in psychosis. However, Quattri doesn't really elaborate on the dimension further, instead moving directly into what he calls the territorial or corporeal unconscious. This is the level of things like family networks, relationships, and collections of partial objects. To illustrate how it works, it's the third that he focuses on. In classical psychoanalysis, partial objects are usually considered to be, well, parts of a whole. Most often, they're applied to organs that make up people. 
like in the case of Melanie Klein's notion of a bad and good breasts. However, Gautry takes a wildly different approach, as he himself puts it. The partial object is not partial in relation to a totality that would be that of the body or that of an entire libidinal topography, but it is the partial object of a dimension of an assemblage. In this unconscious, as the name suggests, the focus is on territories. However, no process of territorialization is free from the destabilizing force of deterritorialization. In this way, partial objects can never become something fully totalized or static. To borrow Gautry's own wording, we find a politics of semiotic collapse here, which characterizes its black holes. When you get too close, or push them too far, territories basically fall into themselves, dissolving in the process. It's on this note that we arrive at the last of the four dimensions, the machinic unconscious. To give a quick recap of the other three, the first and second levels always seek a kind of stability in their respective expressions and contents, even if that can lead to neuroses and psychoses. Likewise, the third, despite always undergoing deterritorializations, also aims at what Gautry calls a pseudo-identity. It's with this in mind that the machinic unconscious becomes so unique. Here, it's a question of far from equilibrium systems, which escape the stratifications of the other dimensions. In his eyes, it can be described as carrying a set of possibles that inhabit and cause every level of assemblage to mutate. As he says, If you like an example, for those of you who have read Anti-Oedipus, this would be a dissociation of the notion of the schizo-unconscious. This gets at the heart of one of the biggest misunderstandings that surround Deleuze and Gautry's infamous capitalism and schizophrenia duology. When they consider the latter to be revolutionary, they aren't talking about psychosis as such, which exists on the level of the material unconscious. Instead, they're invoking this machinic, processual dimension, linked as it is to a kind of radical branching out that keeps the many facets of the assemblage from closing in on themselves. However, as Gautry is quick to add, black holes lurk here too. In fact, just as its possibles can proliferate through every other level, its black holes can accumulate similar phenomena from across a diverse range of domains. His example is the machine unconscious of Christianity, which carried capitalism as a black hole, something that has proven itself to implicate each of Gautry's dimensions. It's at this point that he takes a step back to address the relationship between the four unconsciouses. As dimensions of assemblages, they are always articulated together. You can't have one and not the others, nor is there any sort of fundamental priority amongst them. However, it's also true that there is a tendency for certain black holes to leave a dance. In a given situation, the components of expression from the subjective level might overpower the components of content from its material counterpart. In any case, you can't draw a firm line between where one ends and another begins, something that he seeks to illustrate using the example of a TV and a remote. Listing a few of the heterogeneous elements to make up this assemblage, Gautry says, In my example, there is a formal or formalized surface of representation, a mechanical or electromechanical process, and what happens at the level of a particular object. Alongside these, there is also what's going on in the operator's mind. When it comes to the first dimension, expression appears through the acts of passage that occur between the different elements or levels of the assemblage. Here, we find a process of deterritorialization that splits content and expression. This is followed by a second deterritorialization, which constitutes the traverse levels as belonging to the second dimension, that is, as being content. The third deterritorialization is where it gets particularly interesting, where acts of passage to limit certain regions to produce territorialities. At first glance, such a claim might sound a bit outlandish. How can a territory be generated out of deterritorialization? Leaving the remote assemblage behind, Gautry offers an example of transference, which involves the passage of things like emotions between an analyst and an analyzand. Here, deterritorialization extracts aspects from things like the face, linking them to past relationships, traumas, and so on and so forth. In the transferential assemblage, these faciality traits are essentially generated. Before the analyze and met the analyst, they didn't exist. However, they were turned into a territoriality 
through their very extraction, through deterritorialization. The question now is how far faciality traits can be pushed before falling into a black hole. This is the politics of semiotic collapse that we talked about earlier. Assemblages have a certain territoriality that they can work in. Outside of it, they break down. As Gautry says concerning an assemblage involving faciality traits in a photograph, There are certain thresholds. It's fine. It'll still work. I'll be able to change the grain of the photo, and then it'll be even better, and then at some point, it won't work at all. With this, we now have a set of three deterritorializations that Gautry describes as ontogenetic, corresponding to a set of three dimensions linked to the existence of assemblages. To go over them quickly, the first deterritorialization made semiotization or expression possible. Next, the second deterritorialization brought elements into the assemblage. Finally, the third gave it a certain scope outside of which it can't function. However, we haven't yet spoken about the fourth machinic dimension. This is what Gautry calls the phylogenetic, implicating so-called machinic phyla. These are fields of possibles that involve both the past and the future, implying a certain kind of smoothing of time. To illustrate this, he offers the example of Christianity once again. As can be seen in this diagram, it essentially mutated all the religions that came before it. Retroactively, their problems were taken up in a new way, throwing a different light on them back through time. This is something that is always going on, with new discoveries always shifting the possibles that the phyla carry. The development of a microprocessor, for instance, changes the phylum it is linked to. However, this isn't all there is. We've been discussing the actual, which involves things that are directly represented and involved in the situation. There's also a realm of abstract machines that interlaces all four dimensions of the assemblage and puts the virtual into play. They keep things like Phyla from being static, adding an almost creative element into causality that saves Gautry from critiques of a possible made by people like Bergson and Deleuze. In his words, Abstract machinisms are incarnated in various dimensions of the assemblage, or conversely, various assemblages transform abstract machinisms, mutate them. It works in both directions. In a way, albeit against Gautry's wishes, abstract machines can be described as something similar to essences or platonic ideas. However, they are fundamentally distinguished by the fact that they are not transcendent, nor static, if you have seen my series on Manuel de Landa's Intensive Science and Visual Philosophy, Guattari is almost similar to Deleuze in insisting that the relationship between these machines and assemblages goes both directions. The virtual possibles that the former carry can be actualized into the latter, in the same way that new virtual possibles can come out of those actualizations. It's with this that I would like to conclude, with Guattari getting cut off by the tape recorder before I can really elaborate further. Although this has been a bit of a dense video, I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better. Next time, we'll likely be doing something a bit different. Until then, bye!